Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women became Athenas in their own time by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast four. In this podcast, we will be discussing the book Harriet Tubman, The Road to Freedom by Catherine Clinton. You can use the link on our website at modernathenas.com to order the book after the podcast. We chose to discuss Harriet Tubman as a modern Athena because of her perseverance and warrior spirit. Harriet brought justice to those who could not obtain justice for themselves. Her tireless work to bring slaves to freedom, to assist those in need, and to always give of herself are qualities that are inspiring and extraordinary. We want to begin today's podcast by giving you an overview of Harriet's life. While we won't be able to touch on every part of Harriet's life today in our podcast, we encourage you to read the book and to listen to Catherine Clinton's riveting account of Harriet from childhood through adulthood. Harriet Tubman was born a slave with the birth name Araminta. She changed her name to Harriet Tubman when she escaped from slavery. She was born on a plantation on the eastern shores of Maryland near Bucktown in Dorchester County. Her parents, Harriet Green and Benjamin Ross, were both slaves. There are no records of her exact year of birth, though it is believed she was born around 1820. When she would testify later in life to her birth year, she would place it around 1825. Harriet worked as a domestic slave and later a field slave and was frequently loaned out by her slave owner to other slave owners in the local area. In 1844, Harriet married John Tubman, a free black man. Sometime in September 1849, Harriet took off north for freedom. She made it safely to Philadelphia and began her long career as a conductor and abductor for the Underground Railroad. She made her last run as a conductor at the end of 1860. During the Civil War, Harriet worked with fugitive slaves in Fort Monroe, Virginia, and later in Port Royal, South Carolina. After 10 months in South Carolina, she was put in charge of creating a spy ring. Using the tools she learned as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, Harriet's spy ring was quite successful. She is often credited with the success of the Combahee River Raid in June 1863, which freed 750 slaves. After the war, Harriet returned to upstate New York, where she had a home and lived with her parents. She remarried and was happily married for 20 years. Harriet also continued helping those who could not care for themselves or to claim what they had a right to claim. Harriet helped found the Harriet Tubman House, the only charity outside of New York City dedicated to the shelter and care of African Americans in the state of New York. Harriet passed on March 10, 1913. We pick up Harriet's story in 1844 when she married John Tubman, a free black. Any union between a slave and a free black was not a legal marriage, but was an informal agreement. Intermarriages between free and slave were not the general rule, but in Maryland, especially along the eastern shore, marriages between free blacks and slaves were increasingly common. As Catherine Clinton notes, it is likely that Harriet's enterprising and overachieving manner, as well as her personal magnetism, may have led John Tubman to disregard her status as a slave. There are no surviving descriptions of Harriet and John Tubman's courtship, not even any hints about how they first met. Nor are there any descriptions of their wedding, record of a date, or oral history about the event. Where they lived once they were married, or if they were allowed to even reside together, is also unknown. In 1712, Maryland statute provided that partus sequitur ventrum, or the status of a child followed the status of its mother. This was in response to white males coupling with slave women. The growth of the mixed-race population presented a threat to the white hierarchy, and the 1712 law allowed white men to maintain the status quo, regardless of who they took to bed. Since Harriet's parents were both born slave, Harriet was born a slave, and thus followed that because Harriet was a slave, even though her husband was a free man, any children that they would have had would have been born slaves. However, Harriet was unable to become pregnant during her first years of marriage, which may have impacted the marriage, although records are fairly unclear. So I thought it was really interesting that um, to, to learn about this part of sequitur ventrum, or the status of the child following the status of, status of its mother. Well, we're entering into a world that's completely unlike anything you or I experience. And so just trying to get in the mindset of even that type of uh, decree, in a way, is is kind of hard to wrap my own head around it. But they must have just felt so helpless and powerless against, well, any aspect of life. Yeah, and just the very notion that no matter who your what your paternal heritage is, if your mother is a slave, you're going to be a slave. Um, and just the amount that the white male hierarchy controlled and just 
understanding that control and, and reading Catherine Clinton's account of Harriet's childhood and her early adulthood, it's a fascinating look at what was obviously a very white male hierarchical society. And contrary to this, wasn't, I mean, white women who got pregnant by slaves was a, a was a, an incredibly unfavorable thing in this society because then of course these mixed race children would become free because their mother was free what they talked a little bit about that i th- i think that that is just it's it's so so controlling it's it's kind of overwhelming to think about yeah and just the, i mean the book seemed to suggest that it was obviously far more rare for a white woman and a slave to make a child than it was for a white man and a slave to make a child. And so when this law was put into place in 1712, they were more concerned about the mixed race children that came from the white men and the um, slaves than they were about white women and the slave men. Um, But just thinking about these children that were in this situation where they had one parent who was free, or even um, Harriet's children who would have had one parent who was free, but they themselves wouldn't be free. Um, it's just excruciating to, to, to think about what it must have been like um, for Harriet to be in that position. Well, and I was wondering, I mean, obviously, stress can lead to infertility, infertility issues. And it talks about Harriet not being able to become pregnant. I, I, I mean, I can't even imagine how incredibly stressful a life and hardship on your body it was to be working in these fields. Uh, But I I also wondered, maybe she didn't want her child to have the life that she had because she knew that was inevitable, that they would be, would be slave. I agree. I was, I was left sort of wondering if it wasn't intentional that she didn't have children. Um, And you got a feeling that Harriet early on had these thoughts about leaving for the North and escaping. And I just wonder if in her mind she had considered the fact that escaping with children would have been harder um, and also that the children would have been slaves, whereas if she could have made it North with her husband, she could have had free children. We're going to talk a little bit now about Harriet's, the beginning of Harriet's um, journey North. So Harriet paid a lawyer to investigate her slave status by looking into her mother's background. So as we've just discussed, the status of a child follows the status of a mother. And the attorney discovered that when Harriet's mother had been bequeathed to her current slave owner, it was with the provision that she would be a slave until the age of 45, and then she would be free. So we go to the book, quote, Whether it was mere indifference or intentional fraud, Araminta's mother and her progeny were cheated out of their freedom. The lawyer's findings were devastating to Araminta Ross Tubman. She now believed, on the advice of a white authority, that her mother had been kept a slave for well over a decade past the point when she should have been legally emancipated. Even more damning, perhaps some of Araminta's siblings had been born free. It was the discovery of this betrayal that fueled her resolve to liberate herself." So she became increasingly convinced that she wanted to leave for the North. She started having this conflict with her husband, who became withdrawn from her and the marriage. And the author seems to suggest that the two events were linked, though, again, there's so much that's unknown about Harriet during this time period. In 1849, Harriet decided she could no longer, quote, trust in prayer for deliverance. She needed to combine faith with action. By escaping to the North, she felt she would be doing God's will. End quote. Harriet said, quote, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. End quote. When she escaped north, she most likely took what was a common route for fugitives from the region, northeast along the Choptank River, which reaches far inland, cutting a swath across the Delmarva Peninsula, which is shared by western Delaware, eastern Maryland, and a small offshore slice of Virginia at the southernmost point. Except for a brief wagon ride, her entire journey was most likely by foot, until she was out of the peninsula. The near 90-mile journey would have taken Harriet anywhere from 10 days to 3 weeks to make on foot. The treacherous and unknown journey shows the nerve and resourcefulness that would become her trademark later in life. Harriet made it to Philadelphia, which had a large free black population. Within a year of her escape, she got word back to her husband that she had made it safely. Yet her husband continued to refuse to come north. Eventually, she recalled, quote, he dropped out of my heart. So Harriet seemed to have these feelings fairly early on that she wanted to escape north. But I was just struck by this route that she took. I mean, 90 miles by foot, it was 
it's incredible. And and this certainly shows her courageous nature that is a running theme throughout her whole life. But I was wondering, because obviously there's no maps, there's no GPS, Google Maps, that people started escaping it. I think it was around the late 30s, 1830s at this point. So I wonder if there was kind of this oral history or oral passing down of these pathways. Uh, You know, they talk about the North Star a little bit later, but just the courage that she had to step out into this unknown. And she knew the risk, I imagine. They all knew the stories of people who had tried to escape and got caught and whatever the punishments were. Uh, So it's incredible. Her courage is so strong. And I admire that so much about her. Yeah. And we're going to talk pretty quickly here about the Underground Railroad and how it worked. But I was struck by what you were mentioning about the oral history, because I think that that must have been the way that these slaves knew how to start out north. Um, And again, with the North Star, you're heading north, but but how do you get there? There's roads. You need to avoid um, the slave owner homes. Later on in the book, Catherine Clinton talks a little bit about the fact that Harriet would generally choose months where the nights were long and the days were short because it was easier to move. So I was just wondering, you know, how much of this information did she have when she first set out? Or was it sort of trial by fire and off she went one day and just praying that she could follow the North Star North? Well, it talked about earlier on in her childhood, I think she started thinking about, okay, I need to leave this life. But she would... She also knew the calculated risks she would have to take. And so I bet there was a lot of time kind of plotting. And maybe she did receive information almost through this uh, archaic social network, in a sense. I got the sense that there is this, the Underground Railroad, as we'll get into it, really is this social network. And she had to have felt confident enough to step out, but still knew that she was taking a risk. So let's talk a little bit about the Underground Railroad. So on September 18th, 1850, after Harriet had made it to Philadelphia, Congress passed a fugitive slave law. Referred to as the Bloodhound Law, it provided, quote, local federal commissioners with sweeping authority in fugitive slave cases. They could deputize, preside over summary hearings, remand captives back south from the furthest reaches of the northern cities, and, most galling of all, they could render a verdict without a trial by jury. Any resistance to enforcement would result in exorbitant fines. End quote. In essence, the commissioners in the North were given financial inducements to get into the slave catching business, retain fugitive slaves, and send them back south. The result of the new law was that it moved the real border of freedom north to Canada, because even if a fugitive slave made it to the northern states, they still were not safe from recapture. In order to be truly safe, they had to cross into Canada. So I was just really thinking about this whole notion of for so long, they've probably considered that, you know, for instance, getting to Philadelphia, that was freedom. And if you know any much about the geography of the East Coast of the United States, it's a long way from Philadelphia to Canada. So the book was suggested that the Underground Railroad did expand into upstate New York, but still not all the way to Canada. And so they had to expand the Underground Railroad in order to get these slaves all the way up. Yeah, I looked up. It's uh, fi- about 500 miles from about Philadelphia to Toronto, which is, you know, kind of the, the southernmost point that you can access from the states. And uh, that must have been, I, I felt like they probably, when this law came out and was passed, it was almost as if all these people had finally made it to the to the north and felt like they were free. The rug was just pulled out from underneath them and their whole existence was threatened again. But they responded. This adversity was thrown in front of them and they responded and they said, okay, we're going to press through and and conquer this obstacle as well. Yeah, I was just thinking about, for instance, a fugitive slave that lived in Boston or outside of Boston. Maybe they had escaped, they had made their way all the way north, and maybe they lived there for 10 or 20 years. And then here comes this fugitive slave law, and now, again, their life is at risk. And these slave catchers were aggressive. It wasn't like you know, you could just avoid them by, you know, like today, avoid running into the police. No, these were very, very aggressive rings of slave catchers. And, you know, some of the free blacks even got caught up um, being taken and sent further south. So I can, I can't even imagine how it was like to live in in this constant fear of, of being caught when you did nothing wrong. Well, and the fact that they, 
it says the commissioners were given financial in- incentive essentially to help help the slave catchers you know become slave catchers and what a motivator money can be in the most evil ways i just we, we'll see i mean that's kind of the basis of slavery in a sense is this greed and just disregard for who you have to step over in order to i don't know profit it it's it's, it's pretty sickening it is. So it was under this new law that Harriet began her career working for the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad is now written about in history books and taught to American students in elementary school, but it's often oversimplified and explained simply as a way of how fugitives made their way north stop by stop. The reality of the Underground Railroad was much more complex. The Underground Railroad likely began around 1831 in Kentucky when a slave escaped and headed for freedom in Ohio. The slave swam across the Ohio River, but his master was delayed by seeking a boat so he couldn't follow him right away. By the time that the slave master crossed, the slave had vanished. The master said that the slave had disappeared so quickly that he, quote, must have gone on an underground road, end quote. Before the 1840s, slaves navigated north to freedom using the North Star, as we had just talked about a few minutes ago. It was often the, quote, only friend that the weary and footsore fugitive found. Eventually, Underground Railroad station masters, conductors, and elaborate transportation schemes for, quote, cargo supplemented the North Star during the years leading up to the Civil War. In short, the Underground Railroad became a full-fledged grassroots resistance movement, representing the true national goals of democracy and liberty. We go back to the book. Quote, the system required a series of safeguards for fugitives bound for freedom, and catchphrases and secret wrappings were abundant. The members of the secret network used code words and spoke of themselves as agents of the Underground Railroad. Some were station masters at stations or depots, which were safe houses, where conductors, who were the escorts, and their cargo, the fugitives, might rest before resuming their journey on the Liberty Lines, which were the paths where escorted fugitives were smuggled north. End quote. Many stations or depots employed the usual hiding places, potato cellars, attics, or barns. Some station masters created hidden rooms, secret tunnels, and fake closets. Together, whites and African Americans built up an ne- extensive network of trails, safeguards, lines, and way stations, all the way from Alabama and Florida to Canada and Mexico. Quote, but clearly a very large percentage of fugitives made their way northward along the eastern seaboard, and many crossed over to freedom via Philadelphia. I was really struck when reading this portion of the book because as a child growing up in American public schools, I had no idea of just how extensive the Underground Railroad really was. This book just dives so deep in so many details that I think are forgotten. It was really kind of an awakening for me to even, I felt like I was just learning these things for the first time. And it's, it it was so sophisticated and it says complex, but again, you think about the advantages we have with Facebook and Twitter and the ways we can reach out to people and, uh, and and that this was all done and in, it had to have been fueled by their just intense fervor and unrelenting desire for freedom and liberty that it's, you know, it, it just excelled them but propelled them to be excellent in all these pathways and trying to just refine these networks. Yeah. And the station masters were generally speaking white. And so you had this divide of the white population, those who didn't believe in slavery and those who owned slaves or lived in the South and sort of believed in the idea of slavery. And so these folks who didn't believe in the idea were putting their lives and their families in jeopardy by hiding these slaves on, on their way to freedom. I mean, being a station master was incredibly dangerous. If you were caught or if the slaves who were at your depot at any one time were caught, um, the punishment and the consequences were severe. So that really struck me as well, that they had taken this this danger and didn't seemed to to phase them. I mean, they continued on their quest to be able to get these folks up to freedom. And the book was, it was really interesting to read about how the fugitive slaves as they moved north moved from depot to depot to depot. So sometimes they were given 
like a piece of paper with the next name on it, but they were given instructions on how to get to the depot. And then they handed the paper to the white station master when they got there. Um, and, the, you know, they were illiterate, so they couldn't read what was on the paper, but the paper was in essence a code or a password, meaning that these fugitive slaves were on the Liberty Line and to help them and to pass them north. And there was a one account of, I believe it was Harriet, it might have been later in the in her life, but where she was uh, on a train and she saw her f- like former slave master, I believe it was, and so she picked up a newspaper to pretend to read because that way no one would think that she was a run a runaway because they're illiterate. So um, there was just these tricks, and they became so savvy it seemed uh, and adaptive to the ways, and they had to be passing along this information. I was thinking about how the slaves who are born into slavery never have known any any other environment. So coming up out of these plantations and into essentially civilization, there was so many unknowns that they had to rely on each other to educate them, I think. Right. And Catherine Clinton does a great job of discussing when Harriet first arrived in Philadelphia and what it was like for her to show up in this big city where there were lots of free blacks and it was hustling and bustling and there was immigrants. And she, she did an amazing job at sort of capturing that moment in time. So I would definitely urge our listeners to read the book and to, to listen to Catherine's account of, of what it was like in Philadelphia, which was a free city. So we want to talk a little bit um, about now about Harriet and her role in the Underground Railroad. So most conductors never went south. They conveyed slaves from one specific depot to the next on the Liberty Line, but they did not conduct slaves from the point of origin all the way to the end of the line. The few that did venture south to extract slaves were called abductors by their contemporaries. Abductors were a highly skilled and rare breed of Underground Railroad conductor. In the 1850s, Harriet worked as an abductor, conducting slaves from the South into the North to freedom. Quote, the majority of fugitives who embarked on journeys to freedom, like Tubman, escaped alone. It would attract attention and was much riskier to move in groups. Mass escapes cropped up most frequently in the 1850s and became a specialty of Harriet Tubman's. Few slaves were willing to travel as a large party unless accompanied by a guide, preferably an Underground Railroad abductor who had made the trip before. End quote. As an abductor, Harriet got to know scores of Underground Railroad depots scattered across the Upper South and into the North. There were three Liberty Lines into Philadelphia by the early 1850s. The one generally used by Tubman was the Main Line, a route from Maryland through Delaware via Wilmington. Some claim that this particular Liberty Line was active from the late 1830s, extending from Washington, D.C. to Albany and radiating to the New England states from there. When she began ferrying fugitives all the way to Canada, Harriet became more familiar with the depots in upstate New York. Harriet made her first border crossing into Canada on December 19, eight, sorry, December 1851. Quote, Thus began a seasonal pattern of migration for Tubman, rescuing a large party in the fall, then back to Canada in the winter. After a brief hibernation, she would head for northern haunts to spend time earning money during the spring and summer, and then, during autumn, plan and execute additional raids in the south. She made an occasional rescue in the spring, but much less frequently than in the fall. End quote. So Harriet began her sort of career on the Underground Railroad in what's considered to be the most dangerous job, which is going all the way into the south and ferrying these fugitive slaves all the way up into the north through the series of depots. And we already know that Carriot's courageous, but this is where we really see that she's uh, intelligently fearless. Like she was so smart, it, it it appeared. You know, they say that abductors that went into the South were highly skilled and a rare breed. She was fearless and savvy, and also I I just wonder what fueled her. Like how did she, why did she feel so compelled to take all these risks? And I think it was that she was really in this for the long haul. She knew she now it, she must have felt that this was now her life's mission to save as many people as she could. Yeah. And we're going to talk in a moment about sort of her work methods on the Underground Railroad and how she went about moving fugitive slaves north. But I agree with you. I was struck by her fearlessness and this idea that she was going to return over and over again into the slave South. And this is no small, easy feat. I mean, what you're talking about is as a fugitive slave, she's going back into the area where she escaped. So at any time she could be caught 
and she would be returned to her former life as a slave. Um, and the punishment would be severe. And yet she continued time after time after time to go into the South and pull these fugitive slaves from their point of origin through this series of depots to the North. And I was also struck by just how interesting, like you mentioned earlier, you know, they don't have Google Maps, they don't have cell phones, they don't even have regular maps. And so her ability to move from depot to depot time after time through this network was pretty astonishing. She must have had an incredible memory and uh, whatever, you know, tricks of the trade she had, uh, she used them. And I know I say that she was fearless, but I know that she also was calculated. So there had to have been some, you know, certain things that she was afraid of, but she knew exactly where that line was and when not to cross it, 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 it is, is my impression. But I was wondering what made her afraid, um, even because she just was so strikingly strong in all of this. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about her work methods on the Underground Railroad, because I think that they really illustrate her fearlessness. Quote, when on a mission behind enemy lines in a slave state, Tubman demanded absolute discipline. She was not afraid to exert her authority and forced everyone to toe the line. Tubman even carried a pistol and was prepared to use it, which earned her a reputation for toughness. There were occasions when circumstances dictated that she used force as well as persuasion. End quote. Quote, she had met with success operating within the slave states by patiently laying the groundwork for her raids, studying options and alternatives. Tubman infiltrated a region, gained the confidence of local blacks, and then put out the word about an upcoming flight northward. Her careful preparations and her meticulous arrangements proved invaluable. And although there were many times when she resorted to prayer to rescue her from a tight spot, more often she had multiple escape routes, escape routes lined up as fallbacks. End quote. Her secrecy also served her well. She never advertised her triumphs, even to taunt. It was simply not her style. The stories of Tubman's gift of prophecy and her confidence in the Underground Railroad and the Lord to provide were legendary. She was called Moses, as in the one who led her people from Egypt to the land of Canaan. Quote, Besides a commitment to racial justice and a passion for liberty, Tubman preached the power of persistence. Throughout her Underground Railroad career, she offered the following refrain. If you are tired, keep going. If you are scared, keep going. If you are hungry, keep going. If you want to taste freedom, keep going. End quote. So Harriet exhibited these really interesting sort of work methods um, for her work on the Underground Railroad. And I was struck, for instance, by the absolute discipline that she required. So once a s slave decided to come with her north, she seemed to very much be in control of the group. Yeah, and then he didn't want to stay with the group. He was getting scared. I, I, I think the story c continues on. And, and she said, she brings out her revolver and she says, you are going to be following this group. Otherwise, you're putting all of us in, in, in harm's way. So you fall in line and you're, you know, we are going to move. And then I think it was like two days, two or three days later, they were free in Canada. So it's just, she, she knew what the risks were and would, and would take all the ones she knew she could kind of mitigate. But she was a tremendous leader, obviously. Yeah, and I really took this sort of portion of her work methods and really thought about, you know, the applicability to day-to-day -day life. Because oftentimes, if you can have absolute discipline in what you're doing, and you can make these meticulous arrangements and careful preparations and have backup plan after backup plan after backup plan for your goals, I think you're going to be more successful. And so I really took her work on the Underground Railroad and thought, wow, how applicable it is to my life today. Well, I think at this point, she was also pretty experienced. She'd started making these runs over and over again. So every time she probably encountered something that worked or didn't work, and she filed it away and just kind of had this database of all the options and the and um, kind of the uh, reactions and consequences. And, uh, you know, if we can just be aware each day of and, and willing to be teachable, I bet she it seemed like she was a, a great student, even though she was such a strong leader, and really take stock of everything that's happening and be discerning in the ways we make decisions and how we can improve those decision making skills. Right. And she seemed to make very calculated decisions. So when reading about her work, it never seemed, she never seemed to be frazzled. She would pause, 
she would think about it, you know, and she would make another decision. And if a plan went poorly, she would fall to a backup plan. And like the instance that you gave where a slave came with her in a group and then he basically got scared and, and said, I'm not going any further north. And she said, oh, yes, you are. Um, because not only was he putting his life at risk if he went back, but he was putting the life of the entire party at risk. It was incredibly brave, but also as a fearless leader. And, she, you know, she took care of everybody in the group and she provided direction and that sort of rock that they could lean against as they were heading north. Because again, I can only imagine how absolutely terrifying it was for them to be moving north through these depots, never knowing if they were going to get caught. The book spoke a lot about, you know, about them moving at night. But I mean, just just ponder this idea of trying to make your way at night off the roads because you didn't want to travel on the roads, right? I mean, you could easily get caught on the road. So here they are working through landscape that can be very challenging at night, can't see, trusting that Harriet's going to lead them lead them to safety. And then for Harriet, making this journey time after time and the luck that it involved. And the book spoke a lot about her faith in God um, and that that saw her through and that she would have these prophecies about where to go or where to avoid. And there were a couple of instances where she said that God, you know, moved her from her, her normal route and took her on a secondary route. And as it turned out, that saved the lives of the entire group. Well, and that going back to the quote about how sh secrecy served her well, and she, you know, advertising one's triumphs even to taunt the enemy was not her style. That just spoke volumes about how humble she was. And that was one of the most striking things to me that she and and this is we're still not even she did this for a decade <laughs> and so hundreds of slaves that we'll, we'll hear about but she seemed so humble and and she must have been tempted to kind of flaunt her abilities after a while but she knew that that wasn't the the point the point was to get these people to freedom and that that is a very admirable characteristic of her yeah and as we'll hear about a little bit later the white slave owners started to to know who she was by her sort of going name, which was Moses. Um, and so they, you know, that was like, who is this Moses that's leading these people out of the land of Egypt? And we, we want to catch her. And so the risk for her started increasing even more when the white slave owners became aware of her and her successes on the railroad um, and getting the slaves north. And she was just, I mean, the amount of perseverance to take these people, I, I was thinking yesterday a little bit about the fact that when she would get these groups together, the amount of bravery it took her to pass the word, to stay in the area while she was gathering the group together, and then to still take the group north. I mean, I can't even honestly for myself, I can't imagine doing work like that because I just, I don't know that I would be able to be that brave. Well, and I think the reward that she already had kind of tasted of freedom was, an, it seemed like that had, that was the, I mean, that was the whole reason and the whole point and, and word probably spread of freedom as well. And so the stories of not only the pathway to freedom, but what freedom was going to be like, I'm sure they had, each of these slaves had their kind of dream of what that would be like. So not only did she probably provide some hope, but she really was kind of the hope, the leader of hope for all these people. And what an incredible bright star. Yeah, and I would absolutely encourage our listeners to read the book because it talks a lot about the different trips that she made. And so Catherine Clinton goes into pretty good detail about numerous trips that Harriet made down to the South. And it, she also talks a little bit about what, which, you know, I read a quote about how Harriet would spend, you know, certain months in the north and then she would move to make money before going back south again to do another run. So it wasn't as though she was making these runs every month, but you've got to consider the distance that she had to travel during these runs. So when Harriet escaped, it was 90 miles. She would sometimes go even further south. So, I mean, just think about this notion. You know, people talk a lot about today about, oh, I don't know, hiking the Appalachian Trail or hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. That's a trail. It's made for you. There are markers along the way. There are maps. You know exactly how far you've been and exactly how far you have left to go. You see other people on the trail that you can interact with. You have the ability to get off the trail and get resupplied and get back on the trail and continue on. If something's not working, you have the ability to get off and get a repair made um, or get a replacement part for something that breaks. 
Harriet had none of that. She was basically moving blind only as we talked about just through her experiences that she had as she moved these groups north to know where the depots were, to know how far they could go in a night from depot to depot. Because you have to consider that as well. These depots could be miles apart. So she had to know exactly when they needed to leave the depot in order to get to the next depot before sunlight the next day. So we want to talk a little bit now about what made Harriet so special and why she's what has, has been held up as such a unique person working on the Underground Railroad, because of course there were other conductors that were doing this work. So we go back to the book. Quote, although the anti-slavery campaign was spearheaded by men, women sustained the movement and even assumed positions in local and national leadership. But this was not true of the Underground Railroad. The active agents identified on lists compiled after the fact were overwhelmingly male, with few women identified with this clandestine movement. If a woman did appear in the Underground Railroad records, she was almost always cast in the role of helpmeet as the wife or sister of a prominent male leader. Thus, for most of the women involved in the Underground Railroad, their participation was a family affair. End quote. Quote, this is what made Harriet Tubman's accomplishments so remarkable, as she was certainly the lone woman to achieve such a prominent role within the Underground Railroad. Also, she was one of only a handful of blacks publicly associated with these extensive clandestine operations to shepherd slaves to freedom. Again, she was the lone fugitive to gain such widespread fame. Her unique vantage point, being black, fugitive, and female, yet willing to risk the role of the Underground Railroad abductor, is what allowed her to become such a powerful voice against slavery during the years leading up to the Civil War. End quote. The fame that Harriet Tubman accrued with her string of rescues during the 1850s, especially after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, guaranteed her more acclaim than any of her rivals. Also, the fact that she was never caught enhanced her reputation. So you have Harriet not only making these runs as an abductor, but the fact that she was a fugitive and she was a woman made her incredibly special and unique. Well, and Catherine Clinton talks a lot about the mystery that was kind of around Harriet's persona. She's called Moses. You know, she kind of uh, she she kind of knew these secret ways and and. Um, you know, they must have, some people probably assume she just had some special powers too, because she was never caught. And we'll find out, you know, more about that as well. But, you know, and, and it was almost like superhuman strength and, and the, the amount of risks which we've talked about. But I think what also struck me about getting into this part of the story after she kind of established a home in upstate New York, and she started having family and friends up there, she would always come back to them and then leave. And then she'd be kind of this lone warrior uh, uh, on on the road. And I felt that it was probably a really unusual thing that females, especially uh, with families, being alone on the road was probably not really seen very much. Right. And again, I sort of go back to my example of the Pacific Crest Trail or hiking the Appalachian Trail. And you run into people on the trail all the time who are also hiking the trail. And yet she did all of this work alone. So the only people she met along the way were the group that she was taking north or these conductor or these um, station masters that were running these depots. So there she was all on her own. I mean, she didn't have any backup. She didn't have anyone to lean on. She had to be strong enough time after time to take these people north. And like you mentioned, she once she started, she managed them. The book talks a lot about some of the folks that she brought north, but she did bring some of her family out of slavery in north and got them settled either in Canada or in upstate New York. And the idea that she, once they were settled, yet she continued to go down um, and, and rescue more people was very, in my mind, heroic. Well, and she seemed, by this point, you feel, I, I'm convinced she was destined for this role in a sense. And we didn't talk very much about her childhood, but she was hardened very quickly as a young young five year old already sent to work in homes and uh, I mean she she grew up had to grow up much quicker than you and I had the luxury of doing when we were children so uh, I mean she, she this was kind of a long time in the making that she had this kind of seasoned character and she had so many kind of chances to refine who she was but I think she she was definitely. Uh, had a purpose and she probably felt that and that's what kept her going. 
I agree. And um, Catherine Clinton does a great job about talking again about her faith in God and how that brought her through. And I know some of our listeners are completely non-religious or agnostic, and some of our listeners are very religious. Um, and the book doesn't overly talk about religion, but it but it does mention it numerous times and how her faith really guided Harriet along on these journeys. And that's what sustained her in times of, of peril or nearly getting caught. Um, and by 1858, Harriet saw herself st- starting to step off of the Underground Railroad, giving up her life as a conductor and abductor and retiring more into a role as a station master. She said she as Sonia had mentioned, she set up a home in Auburn, New York. And while working on the Underground Railroad, she had managed to rescue most of her family, uh, as I mentioned, resettling them either in Canada West in settlements right across the border or in the case of her parents in Auburn, New York with her. She also brought a girl named Margaret North and adopted her as her own, but the records are inconclusive as to the basis of Harriet's relationship with Margaret. There's a lot of speculation as to whether Harriet may have been her mother or a sister or a relative of some variety or whether she was unrelated to her at all. In December of 1860, Harriet decided to make one run, one last run south to rescue a couple and their two children from Dorchester County, where she had grown up as a slave. Quote, Maryland slaveholders, fretting over their loss of control, decided to levy stiffer fines for anyone found guilty of aiding and abetting fugitives. They decided that above all, Moses must be stopped. They imagined she roamed unimpeded through their countryside, rousing slaves to flee, mocking their impotence with her every abduction. They hoped by offering incredible sums that they might coax someone to betray her. The price on Tubman's head was anywhere from $12,000, allegedly the legislature's top offer, upward to $40,000, reputedly the total of all rewards put forward to capture her. End quote. After successfully bringing this family to freedom and having spent nearly 10 years as a conductor, Harriet reluctantly agreed to suspend her activities. In her own words, quote, I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. End quote. And you have to imagine, as we've been talking about, the great risk every single time she went south to bring up slaves. She never, not once, was caught, and none of the people in her charge were caught. And I found that to just be incredible. Yeah, I, it kind of leaves you speechless to think of how talented and committed she was and yet she never was arrogant she this is like the only time you really hear her quoting kind of her accomplishment and it's not even with an air of um you know entitlement at all and i was also backing up a little bit about trying to think about these slave uh, slaveholders who felt that above all moses must be stopped and how they kind of then formulated this picture of who Harriet was in their mind um, that probably fueled their kind of contempt for her. You know, they imagined she was just roaming unimpeded and mocked their impotence with her every abduction. And that was not, we know now reading this, that wasn't her outward character at all, but they must have just been um, just so intent on bringing her down that, that she knew she had to have known that, but yet, she pressed on. And just to give our audience some perspective, $40,000 in the cumulative awards today would be $1,090,000. So she had a $1.1 million bounty on her head um, every time that, that she was going south. So, you know, what Sonia talked earlier about the financial incentives for these slave catchers, you can imagine a $40,000 bounty in those days. I mean, everybody wanted her caught. After she became a station master um, in upstate New York in sort of the end of 1860 and the beginning of 1861, she started settling down in Auburn, New York. But in 1861, the North and South became at war and the Civil War began. So Harriet was very involved in the Civil War. So we want to talk a little bit about her involvement, though, again, there's no way that today we're going to be able to go into all of the depth of, of what she accomplished um, as being being part of the effort um, to free slaves and to for the North to win. So we begin the Civil War in Fort Monroe, Virginia. Harriet prof- prophesied that a Union victory would deliver slavery's death blow. She was not originally a fan of President Lincoln's, but because he did not make the 
the abolishment of slavery part of the requirements for a union to win the war, Harriet didn't much care for him. Harriet began her work in the Civil War by informally attaching herself to Massachusetts troops in May of 1861. Trailing along with the all-white troops, she arrived at encampments near Fort Monroe, Virginia. The fort became the major magnet for escaping slaves throughout the region. Once the slaves reached the fort, they were called contrabands. At Fort Monroe, Tubman's role was neither official nor directly related to military operations. She worked with the refugees and devoted herself to domestic duties, including cooking, laundry, and nursing. The Underground Railroad became increasingly dangerous, although the Liberty Lines remained open. So here we have the beginning of the Civil War, and again we have Harriet devoting herself to the cause of helping others, in particular these fugitive slaves who were able to escape to Fort Monroe. Well, and she's kind of coming out of retirement to do so. I mean, she at this point she had stopped. You know, she talks about her last run on the on the railroad, but maybe because she was going to be a little bit more static and with a group, you know, she, and it was almost like utilizing now all of her skills. We'll we'll hear later about her as a nurse and everything, but she she had played a critical role in some in some of these battles, and we'll hear more about that. I was just struck with the work that she did with these refugee slaves. I mean, she devoted herself to these just basic duties, um, cooking, laundry, and, and nursing, and she wasn't above doing any of the sort of scullery work that was required. She just gave all of her effort and time to these basic things and didn't sort of clamor for more. And it made me really think of, of today when, I mean, you have to imagine what kind of status she had in the slave community and in the North by this point because of all of her successful rescues and the fact that she was never caught. And so giving of herself over to this sort of care of refugees and doing this, what could be considered sort of work beneath her just struck me as something that I think that we can all take away from her. Um, and we can all work on, which is, you know, not to think, Oh, work is beneath me, but, but really just getting the work done that needs to be done. Yeah, she was definitely in service of those around here, her. And while the nature of that work kind of changes, she seemed like just an incredibly giving spirit that so many people benefited from. But I think here it seemed like now, whereas before running on the railroad, the goal and the mission was freedom. Now it was kind of, she's tied into this this war and she felt that now this could maybe be the this is like the home stretch and maybe this war will actually kill slavery altogether even though that's not what lincoln uh and uh, really went into the war hoping to accomplish it kind of turned out what it all was going to be become right so in the winter of 1861 through 1862 Tubman decided to join a contingent of Massachusetts volunteers who headed south to Port Royal in South Carolina. Port Royal was one of two barrier islands between Savannah and Charleston and was another fugitive collect collection point. Before heading to Port Royal, Harriet had made her rounds in upstate New York, apparently very aware of the risks of traveling so deeply within to, into slave territory. While it was natural for her to bury deep into enemy terrain, she still was a wanted woman in the slave south. Her work in Port Royal started by creating lifelines for blacks trapped within slavery. She was eager to extend the Liberty Lines into the Deep South. When Port Royal soldiers learned that they were dealing with the famed Underground Railroad conductor Harriet Tubman, they would tip their hats to her when meeting her. Harriet worked as a nurse at Port Royal, one of the few black Northern volunteers. Three out of five Civil War soldiers who died during the war were killed by disease unrelated to their wounds. Harriet's abilities as a root doctor, using local plants to concoct her remedies, made her a legend among her Union comrades. Harriet also took on a number of special projects while at Port Royal. However, quote, considering Tubman's extraordinary talents and track record, she was vastly underutilized during the first several months in Carolina. With her proximity to the front lines, her gifts of disassemblance, her ability to blend in and live by her wits, this former Underground Railroad conductor was an untapped resource. Tubman was eager to take on more challenging work. End quote. So again, I was just struck by she's basically doing a lot of the same work that she was doing on the Underground Railroad, helping these slaves as they're trying to escape deep in the slave south um, and getting them set and, and able to be free. But one difference I saw was now she seemed to have more camaraderie than she did when she was kind of alone as the abductor. And 
I know uh, we were just, this is on the heels of our human computers episodes, but we talked about kind of the camaraderie at JPL. And I, I was actually very much reminded of that because what happened there is they seemed to have a, a mutual respect for each other. And there wasn't, it wasn't cluttered with these kind of prejudices and stereotypes at this point. It seemed like they were really able to just get the work done. And that must have felt like a, a big change from her being kind of the lone warrior on the railroad. Right. And also the fact that she was surrounded 24 seven by other fugitive slaves. So before on the, on, on the railroad, when she would take these groups, she was seen as the leader of the pack and she had to be the strong, fearless person that everybody else could lean on as they were making their way north. And so I just wonder for her how different it was to be surrounded and not every day fearful of being caught. And certainly, certainly there was danger that she was on at Port Royal. But it wasn't the same kind of danger that she was facing on a daily basis, moving people through the Underground Railroad from depot to depot. And maybe before, because she wasn't, she had that uh, danger held held over her head. That's maybe why we saw more nurturing characteristics of her. You know, with the the nursing and uh, nur- the nurse capability she had with the medicine and cooking and laundry, she seemed almost much more motherly in this. Uh, in these accounts than she did on the railroad. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. I was reading about her work as a root doctor, and it made me wonder if that was something that she had learned on the Underground Railroad, because, you know, as you're going through the bramble bushes or through these swamps, I would imagine that sometimes the folks that she was escorting um, would get infections or, you know, some would need some kind of first aid. So I was just wondering if she had learned to use plants along the Underground Railroad to be able to provide first aid to the people that she was leading to freedom. On September 22, 1862, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves in areas still in rebellion, on January 1, 1863. Quote, The intent was to pressure slaveholders into urging their states to rejoin the Union before the January 1 deadline. However, the proclamation did no such thing. Instead, it transformed the Union cause into a war for liberation as well as for union unification. End quote. This is starting to completely change the tide of the war. And Catherine Clinton goes into some good detail about you know the, the black soldiers from the South who were now free um, and talks about the, the slaves who would now be free as of January 1st. And it, it just struck me as this was Harriet's life work. Um, and so I, I was just thinking to myself, you know, how much sh- she must have felt internally this, this freedom and this weight lifted off of her when she was no longer being the sought after fugitive slave. I mean, this was her, like you said, her life's work. And now we're in 1862 and, and it wasn't just, you know, 12, 14 years before this, that she was escaping and, how much change she saw over just a short period of time in her life here. And she still lived uh, 40 years or 50 years more. So it it's, she, she was, and I think at this time she was only about uh, 35 or, or th- almost 40. And so she was wise well beyond her years at this point, but she had seen so much. Yeah, so next I want to talk about the Kambahi River Raid, and I just want listeners to really tune into this because this was an extraordinary raid. Here we go. In early 1863, after 10 months in Port Royal, Harriet was given the authority to line up a roster of scouts to infiltrate and map out the interior. Most of her agents were men recruited directly from the surrounding Low Country. This led to the famed Kambahi River Raid in June 1863. The raid was a sneak attack in the dead of night to catch slave uh, slaveholders off guard in their own backyards. Vintage Harriet Tubman. Three federal ships moved out of St. Helena Sound up the Kambahi River, loaded with 150 black soldiers. Harriet guided the boats to designated spots along the shore where fugitive slaves had hidden. When given the signal, the fugitives boarded the boats and cast their lots into Mr. Lincoln's army. Quote, more than 750 slaves were spirited into Union gunboats that night shepherded by 150 black soldiers. The estates of the Haywards, the Middletons, the Lones, and other Carolina dynasties were left bereft and humiliated. Tubman's plan for freedom was triumphant, end quote. Fewer than a handful of black women can credibly be labeled Civil War spies. 
quote, Tubman's gift was, again and again, to make her appearance when the enemy least suspected, working behind the scenes. Her missions were clandestine operations, and as a black and a woman, she became doubly invisible, end quote. So here you have Harriet leading 150 soldiers on this raid to rescue 750 slaves. I mean, this was no small operation. And whereas before she had gained experience in secrecy and reconnaissance and sort of clandestine operations on the underground, the scale of this operation is just amazing. And again, I feel like it's almost as if everything in Harriet's life is leading up to this point. She's utilizing all of her skills. You know, she's a fearsome, a fearless warrior, and she's uh, nurturing, but she's savvy and smart. And um, she she didn't waste, she didn't seem to waste anything. She was very resourceful. Right. And you have to just think about 750 fugitive slaves. And Catherine Clinton does an amazing detailed account of this raid. But these were not just grown men getting on these boats. These were men, women, children, elderly, bringing all the possessions, whatever they did have on their backs to, to get on these boats. And so you just have to imagine the organizational effort that and completely secret that it took for Harriet and her network of spies to get these 750 people onto the Kambahi riverbanks to be ready to load into these boats without triggering notice of these white plantation owners. And her contribution is clearly, you know, there's no substitute for her ability in this case. And actually, for the first time, you know, her, her being a, a black and a woman is seen as advantages. And so they were pulling out all the stops and, and they really saw her as as the option to get them to be triumphant in this battle, it felt like. Yeah, and I mean, I was just struck just by thinking about what it must have been like for her to do this raid. So here she is. She's got this network of spies that she started to develop out, out amongst the low country. And she's running this whole spy ring by herself, um, which in essence was a little bit like her Underground Railroad work of maintaining, you know, knowledge of all the depots along the way, being able to get in and gather um, slaves that wanted to make their way to freedom. So like you were mentioning, she definitely had some experience in this area. But I just, for me, I couldn't imagine doing this work and just the sheer terror day after day of, of being caught as a spy. Um, and then to be able to sort of plan this raid. I mean, she was a woman and the book talks a little bit about how she was uh, able to plan the raid. But you also have to imagine the fact that even though she was working for the North, uh, an African-American woman wasn't something that was commonly seen. So the amount of sort of wherewithal and value that the white soldiers from the North put into Harriet Tubman just goes to show how remarkable they knew that she was from her work on the Underground Railroad and how good her spy ring was, um, you know, before they allowed her to plan this raid. In the fall of 1863, Harriet's health started to go into decline. And in the summer of 1864, she made the long journey back to upstate New York to her parents and her home in Auburn. That fall, she crossed paths with Sojourner Truth, who is another uh, famous African-American woman of that time. In the spring of 1865, Harriet began to head to New York to return back to South Carolina, but she arrived too late for her designated ride south. She ended up stopping in Philadelphia, where she was urged to return to Fort Monroe to assist with the hospitals where her skills as nursing were urgently needed. She remained in Virginia through 1865. Once the war ended in the summer of 1865, she again headed back north. She learned at that point that her husband, John Tubman, had been gunned down in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was now free to marry. She wedded Nelson Davis, who was a boarder in her house in Auburn, and they lived together until Nelson's death in 1888. We certainly could not do justice to all the work that Harriet did upon her return to New York after the war, but we want to touch on a few key points. Quote, Tubman wanted African Americans to be granted the freedom and dignity they deserved, as well as the legal status they had won. For those who could not care for themselves or claim what they had a right to, Tubman would become a friend and protector. She would dedicate her remaining years to this important mission. End quote. Harriet kept her household filled with family, but also with strangers who needed support. By 1903, she decided to donate the property she had purchased at auction to the AME Zion Church on the basis that the place would be maintained as a home for the aged and indignant colored people. The Harriet Tubman House was open on June 23, 1908, 
and became the only charity outside New York City dedicated to the shelter and care of African Americans in the state. That should have been the age and indigent colored people. Harriet's devotion to women's rights was legendary as well. She would always take advantage of her union with women's friends from her abolitionist days, many of whom transferred their considerable energies to fighting women's rights after the slaves were freed. Harriet would join the suffrage gatherings that were held in upstate New York. In early March 1913, Harriet lapsed into a final illness. She passed away on March 10, 1913. So after the war, Harriet still worked uh, for the betterment of others. And I was just struck that at, at this point, she could have gone home and retired. Quite frankly, when she got off the railroad, she could have remained in upstate New York. Yet she continued her fearlessness and her drive to sort of seek justice for those who couldn't seek justice for themselves. Well, and I was thinking, you know, she kind of was able to bring few to freedom through the Underground Railroad and almost all to freedom with, you know, theoretically through the Civil War ending. And now she she knew there was something beyond just freedom. It felt like she knew people need to get up, uh, you know, settled in their new environment and get on their feet. And they're going to they're going to need a bit of help to just enter this new life. And she cared about all those elements. And, you know, I feel pretty convicted about this because it's kind of at what, you know, it's easy to stop short of, uh, you know, you know, all, all that we can give. And she never did. And so where, what are the areas of our lives that we are stopping short of giving, you know, people time and energy and guidance and, and support? And where can we find those areas that we can even go further. Yeah, and actually, when I was reading this part of the book, it almost in a way reminded me of Mother Teresa. Um, Just Harriet just gave of herself and everything that she had. And she wasn't a wealthy woman, but whatever she did have or she was able to scrounge or she was able to beg for went to the care of others. Um, And just as you were mentioning, this notion of giving of yourself no matter what you have. And, and, you know, I think in today's society, people often, you know, give money um, thinking that, you know, that that's enough, or, you know, maybe they volunteer an hour a week, but just this selflessness that she exhibited of volunteering all the time of giving of everything that she had of all of her energy of her money of her life to helping others was just really, in my mind, very heroic. Well, and it kind of was heartwarming to see her finally near, you know, she's at the end of her life now and she's lived an incredible life where of of giving and fearlessness. And, but now she seemed to have this camaraderie with these women that had been on similar journeys. And it it talks a little bit about in the book, um, you know, kind of, they would go and give these speeches and they were pretty much celebrities now because they could be. And I, I felt that was such a, um, a, an incredible end to, you know, this era. And I was very happy that she saw that element to her life. Yeah. And the book also mentioned um, in pretty good detail that after the war, Harriet started about a 30 year battle to obtain compensation for her time in service. And at the very end in February, 1899, she finally reached a compromise and she received $20 a month as a pension but her wartime service also became part of the congressional record. And I just thought, wow, how incredible is that? Um, Here you have a woman who was illiterate, who we don't know much about from the beginning of her life because there's no written documentation about her, all the way just in one lifetime of work, being able to be, you know, part of the congressional record and fighting for suffrage in upstate New York with these other, you know, prominent women that you, you hear about in history books. And, I just thought, what an incredible life she led. Well, and she must have had a vision for a better life. Like, I, I can only imagine that something inside of her knew that slavery was not her purpose. She, that you know, and or anybody's purpose. But uh, she must have had a grander vision. And I, you know, that that gave me pause to think about what grander vision can I have for you know my life and my family's and our countries, and, you know, and, and while who knows what the path is to realizing a better world, uh, it, she just seemed to take one step at a time and trust that that was the right step to get her where she wanted to go. Right. And, you know, it was very interesting because 
you had mentioned early on that she seemed very humble. She didn't seem to know to to really believe that her work was as heroic as it, as it was. And so I took that, you know, to kind of heart and think, what are things I can do in my life that are small things to help change the world? And, you know, you and I started this podcast as, as one way that we can reach out and sort of change a small portion of the world or to, you know, reach out to others. But I was definitely left struck with she took what she had, which was so minimal, and she gave her time and all of her energy and just devoted herself to the cause. And I, I do think, you know, what are those things that we can do that with? And, and what kind of capacities do we have now in modern times with all of our technology and just globalization to really help others? And I think Harriet would expect us, as she said, you know, to keep going, that never become complacent and static in our lives. You know, obviously, have an immense amount of gratitude for what we do have, but not stop there. You know, she she was so um, tireless in in her work. And, you know, I mean, she she lived to a, a very old age and she accomplished an overwhelming amount that she probably, like you said, she probably wasn't, she wasn't looking for the, the, the credit. She did a lot of that in secrecy. Uh, and so we don't, we shouldn't either do it for the credit. We should do it because there's, that's the way to make a better world. Yeah. And I, I was struck by that in relation to the women at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that we talked about in Rise of the Rocket Girls, our first podcast, who also did this work with no credit, and the women at Langley and Hidden Figures who did this work with no credit. And yet, day after day, they went to work, they persevered, they they put their head down and they grinded, they got the job done. And I just think today, everybody is so fast to post credit to themselves on social media or announce their next big thing and talk about themselves on, on social media or to others and take credit for everything that happens. Um, and, you know, people forget it takes a team, it takes a village, it's something bigger than you. And so I think just remembering that, you know, when you're working on a team or, you know, you're, you're doing great things, there are lots of people that helped you along the way. And this, it's not a victory just for you. It's a victory for them. And to share that great triumph with other people and stay humble was definitely something that, you know, I've, I've been thinking about as we've gone through these books. Harriet's credited with seeing 300 slaves to freedom as a conductor. Those freed during her wartime service in South Carolina, including the 750 freed in the Combahee River Raid alone, have been left uncounted. Quote, There are by now thousands of African Americans whose grandparents or great-grandparents traced their freedom to Tubman. End quote. The list of those whose lives were forever changed by her work with the Underground Railroad or Union Army will continue to grow through the generations. 300 slaves as a conductor. I mean, I can't, in eight to 10 years, I can't even imagine um, what it was like. And she never, not once was caught um, in her work. And so I was just, you know, if you, if you can think of a room of 300 people or an event you've ever been to with 300 people and think each of those people was individually led by Harriet from depot to depot, the dozens or hundreds of miles north to freedom. And we can't take that achievement for granted either. And while our lives are very different now because of all the, you know, the last several hundred years leading up to now, what is what is the part of that legacy that she's left that we can kind of continue to carry on? I'm, I, I'm definitely going to spend some time thinking about that, obviously, but it's, it goes without saying she, she is an incredible contribution to civilization. Yeah, and I was thinking of that, the quote that I read about the thousands of African Americans who grandparents or great grandparents can trace their freedom to Tubman. And you have to understand what the slave South was like at, at the time when Harriet was running um, these folks up the, tr up the Liberty Line to freedom. You know, people didn't live as long as they do today. And slaves in particular had an incredibly, incredibly horrific life and often died young. And so you think about these these people that Harriet took to freedom who then had long lives in freedom and who were able to have families and children and great grandchildren who now are sort of walking the face of the earth due to Harriet Tubman's conductor work. And on that note, that's all that we have for today. 
Thanks for listening and downloading and sharing this experience with us. You can also continue to interact with us and follow us on Facebook and Twitter, where we announce our episodes and share additional information about each podcast. If you have questions or comments about today's podcast, please submit them to us via our website at modernathenas.com or on our Facebook page, Modern Athenas, or our Twitter account, at Modern Athenas. We would also very much appreciate if you could support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Google Play and subscribing to our podcast. In our next podcast, we will be discussing a book entitled, In Other Words, by Jhumpa Lahiri. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like each of the modern Athenas we have been discussing, have the power and capacity to be a changemaker in your world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars.